tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Hope Grove, Kentucky had a dirty little secret, a house of ill repute which allegedly operated with the full knowledge and protection of the police. Then two prostitutes were murdered and the brewing scandal boiled over. 24 years old, blonde, pretty, an Olympic hopeful, and missing for 18 months. Could her husband have masterminded Amy Bechtel's disappearance? Mississippi River, 1947. Mary Green piloted the riverboat Delta Queen for two years before she passed away. Some crew members are convinced that she never left her post. When she was only 14, Margie Hamilton was forced to marry a man four times her age, then forced to give up their firstborn for adoption. Perhaps you can help create a mother and son reunion. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Join me for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Double murder, allegations of police corruption, a house of ill repute, and a madam who refuses to keep quiet. It has all the elements. It's a kind of case guaranteed to rip a small town apart. September 20th, 1994, 3 a.m. It was called the New Life Massage Parlor, but everyone in Oak Grove, Kentucky, knew the girls were prostitutes. This night, customers were scarce. Gloria, I'm gonna go ahead and take Sarah home. And then Mary and I are gonna grab some drinks. Do you wanna go with us? No, no thanks. Are you sure? Uh, yeah, I think I'll just... 22-year-old Candy Belt was a single mother working to support two young children. 18-year-old Gloria Ross had been married less than a year and had a six-week-old daughter. Two young women, perhaps a bit desperate, just trying to pay the bills. Within the hour, both of them would be dead shot execution style, their throats slashed. I felt some responsibility for their deaths, at least. Tammy Papler ran the New Life place. Massage Parlor. You know, it's kind of like I'm, I'm like their mom and I'm responsible and I'm supposed to see this through. Almost three years went by and the case remained unsolved. Then Tammy Pepper went public with stunning accusations about the police department. Accusations that have been widely disputed. I don't think the murders were ever meant to be solved. They thought if it got solved, it would be a really big embarrassment to have two police officers arrested for killing two prostitutes. Bring somebody the proof and the evidence needed for indictments or convictions. I will assist any agency in their apprehension. Until then, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody. Hi. Tammy Pepper opened the New Life Massage Parlor in 1992. Yeah. Like the tiny town of Oak Grove, its main business was serving the soldiers at the Army's Fort Campbell, a half mile down the road. Right, BB. According to Tammy Pepper, the police didn't shut her down because they stood to benefit in a big way. She says New Life Massage Parlor became City Hall's golden goose. The police department would pick out specific things for us to buy and they would order them. I know there were lights for just about every car, shoes, uniforms, um, canine t-shirts, Christmas parties, Christmas bonuses. They get basically what they want. Those little seven or eight police officers and the mayor run the whole town. Hi, Ed. Oh, the 
Tammy. Papler says one Oak Grove police officer took excessive advantage, a patrolman named Ed Carter. Carter has denied the accusations you're about to hear. So what can we do for you today, Ed? Oh, well, I was just in the neighborhood and... Ed Carter would ask a lot more than the other officers would. So he wanted services, and it was like, well, I know what's going on. You know, I'm a police officer. Who are they going to believe, you or me? He had the gun. I didn't. Someone asked me for money, and they have a gun. I'm going to give it, especially one that I know can put me in jail. And that's, that's exactly how everything got started. According to Tammy Papper, once Carter got started, he didn't stop. He insisted that she contract with him for janitorial services, services that he reportedly intended his own wife to perform. Papler claims Carter soon became a fixture at New Life. When she went on vacation, Papler says Ed Carter virtually took control of the massage parlor. Ed, what are you doing? Hold up, just making sure I'm down my money, Ed. No, I'm down. What's going on? Hey. Just taking care of business. How long has he been here for? Ever since you've been gone. It was like he was the madam. I wasn't the madam anymore. It was actually like he was. He was the one who was in charge of the parlor. He was running it. Ed, put down my money. Look, I've helped you from day one. Ed, how much money of mine have you taken? I was furious with him. I didn't want him around my business anymore. I didn't want him around the girls. I informed the girls, you keep the door locked. If he comes in, you just shake your head no. Don't allow him to come inside this business. Get out of here! I told him, don't ever come around here again. You stay away. And I made sure we had had a meeting, and I informed each and every one of them this. You do not allow him around here anymore. It's the end of it. A few weeks later, the murders. Oak Grove police were on the scene minutes after the bodies were discovered. Please, I only want to see uniformed officers in this building. By the time Major Billy Gloyd of the Christian County Sheriff's Department was called in to assist, the crime scene had been severely compromised. I want to see only uniformed officers in here, sir, outside now. The Oak Grove officer in charge was Detective Leslie Duncan. According to Tammy Papler, he was well known to her. Duncan was also Ed Carter's former roommate. I feel like Ed Carter killed them. I honestly do. I feel like he is the one who actually pulled the trigger. Mr. Carter's never run. He's never fled the area. He's never left the area. Whenever he was questioned, he always cooperated. Uh, and I find it troubling that after three years that they are no closer to making an arrest of, of the, anybody, much less Mr. Carter. Three years is a long time. Memories fade. Evidence disappears. Uh, and the only thing that's the same here is these bare, unsupported allegations that are being made by the Paplers. And I just, I just question the motive. I question their interest in this thing. Good evening, ladies. Slow night, huh? According to the Sheriff's Department, Ed Carter freely admitted he stopped by the massage parlor that night, but claimed he went home to his wife at 3 a.m. before the murders occurred. Carter and his wife have since gone through a divorce. She disputes her ex-husband's alleged account. He came in a few minutes after 4. I made it a habit of looking up at the clock when he came in. The two women were shot with a small caliber gun. The police say Ed Carter told them he owned no such weapon. Again, his ex-wife disagrees. Ed did own a small caliber gun. He kept it under the mattress for my protection. It was not there that night. I had not seen it from the Christmas before the shootings. Ed Carter voluntarily took a polygraph exam a few weeks after the murders. I can't tell you whether or not he passed or failed his polygraph. The only thing I can tell you is uh, that he did resign from the police department and that he did secure an attorney after the polygraph. Soon after, Ed Carter moved to another part of Kentucky. A year later, Leslie Duncan also voluntarily resigned. Despite Tammy Papler's efforts, the murder investigation languished. Finally, claiming she was fed up, Tammy decided to make a public stink. State your name, please. Tammy Papler. She chose a city council meeting on July 15, 1997. There were two 
girls killed in the massage parlor. I feel like they don't think these lives were important, that these girls were as important as if, um, I don't know, maybe if there was a deputy's daughter or a mayor's daughter. But I just feel like they felt they didn't have to investigate it because no one's going to ask any questions. They're just two dead prostitutes, and no one's going to care about it. I have returned. But at least one person at City Hall did care. The one person who said she could verify some aspects of Pepper's story. Enter City Councilwoman Patty Ballou, once known as Harley, one of Tammy's girls. I announced to everybody that her allegations of police corruption and things of that nature were true. I'd known about them, about them coming in the parlor. And the reason I know about that is because I used to work there. Patty Ballou had worked at the New Life Massage Parlor for two years. She claimed she knew Ed Carter and some of his friends. I always felt that the police officers were involved. They were there all the time. They knew the routine. They knew everything. They knew the ins and the outs about the place. Just, there's so many things that just kept pointing towards them. Ed Carter did not commit these murders. Yes, Ed Carter did work at this facility as a janitor, but Ed Carter did not commit these murders. He wants to have this matter, as far as he's concerned, brought to closure. He wants to see the final chapter written, where it can be stated, without a doubt, that Ed Carter had absolutely nothing to do with the murders that occurred in the city of Oak Grove. Two young women dead, two families destroyed, and a killer walking free. The controversy makes it all too easy to forget. I hope that justice will be served. I hope that they charge the police officers. I hope they clean up the corruption. And I hope they start the town all anew. Because that's the only way that it can honestly be cleaned up and brought. But most of all, I want Glory and Candy to know that we fought for them, and that we're going to see justice is served for them. Coming up, in Wyoming, a marathon runner mysteriously disappears. Could her husband have been involved? Late afternoon, late summer, a runner moves easily along the mountain switchbacks, high above the small town of Lander, Wyoming. Her stride is strong, smooth, that of a dedicated athlete, an Olympic hopeful. Her name is Amy Rowe Bechtel. She is 24 years old. On this day, she runs into the tall trees of the Shoshone National Forest and disappears. Sam and I are going to Du Bois. Earlier that same day, it was a typical day for Amy and her husband, Steve. Yeah. I'm going to have the uh, phone turn on in the new place today. OK. Bye. Bye. Steve was going rock climbing with a friend, and Amy was going to teach a fitness class. Amy and Steve Bechtel had been married for a little more than a year. Both were competitive athletes, running for Amy, climbing for Steve. They moved to Lander because its rugged terrain made it a perfect training ground. Amy's always really fond of saying, you know, let's retire now and then we'll work when we're old. Yeah, we, we have some debts and we have, uh, have to work some odd jobs and things like that, but basically every day we live the way we want to. Amy and Steve had recently bought a home of their own. They planned to move in over the next few days. The night before Amy disappeared, I went over with Steve and Amy to see their new house and to help them move a load of stuff over there. And Amy showed me where she was going to have her sewing room and where Steve was going to have her, his gym. And they were just really excited about the house. Amy had a long list of errands that day. Call the phone company, get the gas turned on, buy home insurance. Once those tasks were done, she turned to something fun planning a route for a 10K mountain run. Hey, man. 
What'd you find? Hey, Todd. Found a nice friction climb. How tough. When Steve returned from his all-day climbing trip, Amy wasn't home yet. Couldn't do it today. We were just talking hey, casually, man. and he asked about Amy. And that's, uh, I said, I don't know, she's up somewhere. She goes, okay, no problem. Hey, guys. Hey, Steve. Early evening. What's cooking? Steve hey, stopped man. by the neighbors. Todd and his wife, Amy, were making dinner. Where's Amy? Amy Bechtel still wasn't home. Well, there's plenty. I think he was getting more and more worried at this time. She usually leaves a note. I'm sure she'll be back soon. He wasn't Great. panicking by any means because it was still light and still, you know, she could have been out doing something. It was, it was not an, an uh, unordinary day for Amy. So we didn't think it was unusual that she was gone. But when we got back from the movie, I was really worried. Amy's not back yet. She's not back? No. I haven't heard anything from her. I called the police. They're out looking for her. Todd and Amy searched roads where Amy Bechtel most likely went running. Steve stayed behind, hoping his wife would call. Todd and I had been driving on the loop road for about an hour or so, and um, right around 1 o'clock, we glimpsed Amy's car pulled off the side of the road. Look, Todd, there it is. OK. That's her car. We saw her car there, and it was like, you know, we were relieved. It's like, oh, man, we thought we'd found her. So I walked up ex completely expecting for her to be in the car. She's not in there. Like, and had um, run out of gas or not been able to start it or a dead battery or who knows what the heck. I'll go call the sheriff. Amy! At that point, it was relief, you know, and concern because, you know, her car's still up there and it's, it's you know, after midnight and, you know, she's probably cold and maybe has a twisted ankle. Hey! But Amy was nowhere to be found. Not in a few minutes, not even a few hours. Amy! By morning, the search for Amy had expanded dramatically. Soon, dozens of volunteers were scouring the mountains. Eventually, more than 500 people covered a 20-mile radius. Not a single clue was found. We should have found Amy Bechtel if she were a runner up there and nothing else entered the picture. Could she still be there? Yes, but uh, given the circumstances, the lack of clues, I don't think she is. After eight days, the massive search was called off. Where was Amy Bechtel? Her sunglasses, car keys, and to-do list are on the seat of her car, apparently just as she had left them. Only her wallet was missing. If she wasn't injured, did something terrible happen to her? Had she been kidnapped, even murdered? Sheriff's investigators soon tested a theory some found shocking. Steve, you know what this is? No. This is evidence that ties you directly to Amy's disappearance. <laughs> what? I can't believe this is happening. I was pretty blown away, you know, and I turned to Dave. I was like, you know, Dave, what's going on here? Man, this is, this is not cool. He was floored, basically. He uh, slumped down in the chair. We have some serious questions about you and your wife's relationship. The best thing you can do right now is cooperate. The guy says, look, if you take a polygraph test, we'll get this cleared up right now. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, if you guys are accusing me of something I didn't do, I'm going to want to talk to legal counsel here. I wouldn't let any client take a lie detector test. They're completely inaccurate. Uh, they come in about one third of the time as a false positive and uh, it would be a terrible injustice to Steve if he fell within that one-third false positive and it was used wrongly against him. So, Steve Bechtel did not take a lie detector test. Deputies, armed with a warrant, searched his home. Among the items they confiscated were a series of journals Steve had been keeping since high school, journals investigators found potentially incriminating. We've obtained many pages of writings, journals, if you will, of Steve Bechtel's. Those are uh, somewhat disturbing. There are song lyrics in there, and there are writings about power and death, some about killing people. Sheriff's investigators asked Amy's family and friends to read excerpts. Did you see that? I was 
floored. This guy, you know? At that point, my wife and I, we both thought, you know, there are some things that we've seen in the past that, you know, maybe somebody should be aware of. So how there was one night, for instance, when Nels Rowe and his wife had Amy and Steve over for dinner. How did you get that bruise? It's nothing, it's just a bruise. Just a bruise? Just a bruise. You know, Steve can get a little rough sometimes. Amy just laughed it off, would not look me in the eye, and I said, that is not a normal reaction, particularly for Amy. Deputies also found a camper who claimed that on the day Amy disappeared, she had seen a blue pickup driving fast on the mountain roads near where Amy's car was found. A man was at the wheel, a blonde woman in the passenger seat. The next day, the camper saw the same truck at the search site. Based on that information, we showed her pictures of Steve Bechtel's truck, and she concluded that that was the same truck she had seen. Evidence seemed to be mounting against Steve Bechtel, but was that evidence accurate? Statistically, he did it. And, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying he did. The first person we have to eliminate in a case where there may be a foul play involved in, in one's disappearance is the person closest to that person. Sheriff's investigators believe there were vital gaps in Steve's activities that day, time when he could have harmed Amy. He was with people all that afternoon and evening, so I don't, I don't have any question about, about that. He just didn't have the time. But what about the camper who said she saw what might have been Steve's truck? According to phone records, Steve made a call from his house at 4.43 that afternoon. Johnny, hey, it's Steve. That's about the same time the camper saw what she alleged was his truck on the mountain road, a 45-minute drive from the Bechtel's home. I don't see how Steve ever had the time to get up to where Amy's car was and back. And what about motive? Investigators believe Steve's journals show a desire for power and control that may have led to murder. Steve and Amy's friend Todd Skinner strongly disagrees. He thinks Steve is innocent. A psychologist can read anything into any writing that you can ever wish to put in there. And to me, I've never seen more innocuous writing taking, taken uh, out of context more heavily to, you know, to a worse result. This year, runners competed in the run for Amy in her hometown of Douglas, Wyoming. Amy's family and friends were there to honor her memory, but they still want answers. They want Steve to take a polygraph test. I don't feel like me going in and getting attacked is going to solve any problems. I feel like, uh, you know, I went and I tried to work with Dave and it didn't work out. Um, and, you know, things need to get solved a different way now. Did Steve Bechtel murder his wife? Steve and his family believe a stranger could have kidnapped her. Or a motorist could have accidentally struck Amy and in a panic disposed of her body. Next, meet a young man and woman whose lives have been changed forever by a riverboat captain who some call the matchmaker ghost. The Delta Queen, a national treasure, was built in the 1820s. During World War II, she transported wounded soldiers to hospitals. Then the vessel was refurbished to carry vacationers. She is one of the last living monuments of the Romantic era when steamboats plied the Mississippi. But there is another side to the Delta Queen, a rather scary side. It was a stormy December night in New Orleans. The Delta Queen rested impatiently for repairs. Her first mate, a single man named Mike Williams, was the only person on board. I was quite exhausted and was sleeping a very deep, solid sleep uh, when I was awakened by a sound, as if someone had said, psst, next to my ear. I was quite startled because I was, couldn't understand how someone could have gotten in my room and out so quickly without me hearing the door open and close.
there was a very loud slamming of a door back in the after cabin lounge area. And I had personally made sure that every one of those doors was locked before I had retired. There was not supposed to be anyone on the vessel. I proceeded down several doors until I arrived at cabin 109, and it swung open in my hand. I was a little frightened and intimidated. I took a flashlight and looked in the room. There was no one there. Mike had heard stories that the steamboat was haunted. He had always brushed them off. But how could a door that was locked suddenly slam shut? That's what drew him to cabin 109. That moment for the skeptical Mike Williams was clearly frightening. Indeed, it would be the first incident in a chain of events that would change him forever. Two women would soon come into his life. One was a co-worker on the Delta Queen. The other was also a worker on the ship, but had died 40 years earlier. Mary Green had been one of a handful of women to ever pilot a steamboat. She was in charge of the Delta Queen from the time it was purchased in 1947. Mary was 79. She oversaw a lot of the day-to-day -day operations, financial, even navigating the boat, managing deckhands, painting the paddle wheel, supervising food preparations and everything. She really doted on this boat. She loved it. Sadly, after only two years of piloting the boat, Mary died. Where? Where else? Cabin 109, the same cabin that was mysteriously unlocked that night. Much of what Mary Green did when she was alive, Mike Williams does now. But Mike had no idea that Mary's unearthly connection to him would transform his life in a very surprising way. Another night on the Delta Queen, this one in June 1985. Hello? An attractive young woman named Myra Frugé a new Delta Queen employee was working late. I received a call from an elderly lady in a cabin, and she stated that she was cold and she was very uncomfortable, and could I please send someone? At this uh, particular evening, Mike Williams was the mate, and I called up there and he answered, and I told him the situation. Hello? It's the mate. Does someone need help? Myra had sent him to cabin 109. The beds were made, little mints on the pillows. The room was obviously unoccupied that cruise. It was around this time that I had this feeling that somebody was behind me or looking at me. And certainly through the window, I saw this little round, benevolent face but something was eerie about it. I thought, well, perhaps that's the lady who needs assistance. So I walked out of the purser's office to see if I could catch up with her and talk to her. And she wasn't there. There was no one outside on the decks. I was, you know, a little shook up, and I went back into the purser's office. Yeah, come in. Miss Fruze, I uh, just came from room 109. There's nobody there. You're sure it was 109? Absolutely. No passenger was registered for cabin 109. Mike held his tongue about who had once occupied the room. Well, right after I called you. But Myra told him about her odd experience. She was so upset by it that Mike offered to walk her back to her cabin. Wait. That's the woman I saw. The woman in the portrait was Mary Green. It was very, very scary at, at first. Surprising, too, because I just saw her on the deck. But uh, for me, it was uh, kind of exhilarating. I began to suspect that someone was trying to introduce me to this young lady. Myra and I became very close. We just clicked. Each one of us had something that the other needed. Captain Mary in life had become matchmaker Mary in death. 
Mike and Myra fell in love and got married. We stayed together, a newlywed couple, in uh, a tiny cabin on board the vessel. And uh, that is where our beautiful daughter, Heather, was conceived. I certainly believe and am very thankful you know, f for um, that nice spirit in our life, Mary Green, who brought us together. I believe sincerely that so long as I care for this vessel in some way, that the Captain Mary Green's spirit will protect our family and guide us as she has. Myra and Mike are living happily ever after. Mary, meanwhile, lives happily in the hereafter, watching over them and the Delta Queen. America's highways are becoming a war zone. Forget to signal when you switch lanes or dare to play the radio too loud, and you could find yourself under attack. It's a modern madness, road rage. People have been upset on the highway as long as there have been highways. The problem today is we got more crowdedness. We got more cars and less room, and we're a little impatient today than we were in the past. The smallest thing can get us going. You're in my way. I'm trying to get to my destination. I feel frustrated. And frustration leads to aggression. February 5th, 1997. It started as a minor fender bender, hardly worth reporting. Jeez, I, don't freaking I was this. in my own lane doing the speed limit. You apparently hit me. What hit are you me. telling me? Hey, just settle First you down. You me off the highway, and now you pull this self righteous crap? You piece of garbage. Hey, you haven't got the right to talk to me like that. Let me see your license. Yeah, you want to see my license? Yes, I... 47-year-old Richard Adderson had been shot once in the chest. What you're about to hear is his desperate plea for help. State Police, second 911. I did an edge was when she shot. What's your name, sir? Richie Adderson, I'm just shot. He pulled the gun and shot me. Please help me. Okay, we have an ambulance on the way. We had an accident. Ben deserves this. He just pulled out a gun. Shot me. Oh, please help me. He wore glasses. I couldn't believe that he had been shot. You, you live in an area that you think is safe. Um, we came from New York City. We moved north. I couldn't believe that something like that could happen here. When I heard the 911 tape, I had an overwhelming sense of Richard's pain and his fear. I think his fear was for his family and his children. Richard Adderson, beloved family man, respected educator, died less than an hour after making his futile call to 911. The incident occurred during a rush hour accident on eastbound I-84 in Fishkill, New York, about two miles past the Newburgh Beacon Toll Plaza. Evidence indicates Richard Adderson was sideswiped by the other driver and both men pulled over to the shoulder. I have never come across another crime that uh, parallels this one. We're speaking here about a minor property damage automobile accident that escalates into an argument and results in the death of one of the individuals. Though no one saw the accident or the shooting, there were witnesses to the argument. The gunman was middle-aged, balding, and wore glasses. Richard Adderson added another detail. His assailant had a beard. The gunman drove a green 1997 Jeep Cherokee with New Hampshire plates. Though the shooting occurred in Fishkill, New York, state troopers are naturally tracing all such vehicles registered in New Hampshire. In the meantime, Richard Adderson's family and friends mourn his passing, still unable to understand why. I don't think we are dealing with it. I don't think that you can deal with this. My youngest son this morning told me when I came here, how long are you going to be? You have to be really careful in the car. Something could happen to you. Those are the fears that he has because I'm his only parent that, that's left. My two older daughters can't even speak about this. 
it's unfathomable to, to have to experience this. Next, two families search for their long lost children. Perhaps your help can lead to a reunion like this. In this next segment, we hope you'll be able to reunite two more families. Both lost loved ones many years ago. Their most cherished hope is to find them before it is too late. I take thee as my wedded husband. I take thee as my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. Imagine you were a young girl, barely 14. For better or for worse. Your mother is dying. In desperation, she begs you to marry a man she hopes will care for you. Do us part. A man more than four times your age. may kiss the bride. That's exactly what happened to Margie Elizabeth Hamilton in May of 1932. Over the years, she told the story to her daughter many times. The pain as vivid as if it had happened yesterday. My mother didn't really want to marry because she was a child and uh, she wasn't happy about it. And she told her mother that she didn't want to marry him. But my grandmother was afraid that there wouldn't be anyone to take care of her and she'd be left in the, in, you know, alone. By the authority vested Margie's new husband was James Austin Baker, a lumberyard worker in Atlanta, Georgia. Within a year or so of their marriage, Margie gave birth to a son, Benjamin Austin Baker, Benny for short. To her, it was, he was a doll, <laughs> you know, it was her doll. And she just was really, really happy with him because, she, you know, she's a very loving mother. Her husband, however, was not pleased. He already had three grown children from a previous marriage. He didn't want more. When Benny was 18 months old, he became ill. So ill that Margie had to leave him in the hospital for three days. When she returned, her baby was gone. She was hysterical and, and trying to find out where to go to try to get him back, and no one would give her any information. Behind her back, her husband had given Benny up for adoption. How did my husband do this to me? He's my son, please. <laughs> there was nothing she could do. Benny was gone. And I said to her, Mama, why did you stay with him after he did this? And she said, he always promised me that he would sign the paper so that I could get Benny back. And that's the reason that I stayed with him. Three years later, Margie gave birth to a daughter, Naomi. Three years after that, her second daughter, Lois. He tried the same thing to get rid of us too, my sister and myself. And we were in California at the time, and the, the laws were different, and that was in the 40s, so she, he couldn't. And by that time, my mother had learned to read and write, so they didn't take us away from her. In 1944, James Baker died. Finally, Margie was free to search for Benny. But when she went back to the orphanage in Atlanta, she was given only a photo taken when Benny was about seven years old. They told her the records were sealed to forget she had ever had a son. She gave up at that point, that she just figured that she would never see him again. But she, her main thing was she always wanted him to know that she didn't give him away, that he was literally stolen from her. Lois knows there may not be much time left for a reunion, but she clings to the hope that she can give her mother, now 80, one last precious gift. It would be so wonderful to be able to, you know, say, Mama, here's Benny. Here's your son. Mama, here's your son. Hopefully, Lois will get a chance to say those words. Another family is also eager to have that opportunity and their search is equally heart-wrenching, this time for two sons. 
January 23, 1950. Twin boys, Jerry and Terry, were born to the Robinson family in upstate New York. They were the youngest of six children, welcomed and well-loved. But Terry had health problems and their father was out of work. Times were very hard. Gail Robinson, the oldest child, still remembers how they struggled to make ends meet. I don't think there was uh, enough uh, to go around for, for all of us, uh, that's for certain. And so I think that's, that's when it became apparent they had to do something. The twins were just eight months old. Gail was six. Honey, I know this is going to be hard for you to understand, but the babies are going to go away today. They're going to go live with another family. And Terry, he's going to see the doctor. The doctor's going to make them all better. And we'll get to see him again one day. I promise. OK? <laughs> And I spoke to the adoptive A local parents. minister said he would find the twins a good home. He also promised that the boys would be kept together and would be given college educations. And at the age of 18, they would be told about their birth parents. I promise I'll see you again. It's time. After that day, the Robinsons never heard another word about their twin boys. They never knew if the conditions had been kept, if they had ever been told that their birth family still mourned their loss. Nine years later, Gail's father became fatally ill. I promise, I'll find the twins. My mother is now 76 years of age that it really would be something that would, would um, give her some peace of mind if, if she knew what, what happened to them. And that's the twin brothers page. Over the years, the Robinsons tried their best, but all these turned out to be dead ends. They have now built a website that features photos of the twins as babies and their siblings at various ages. Both boys may bear a strong resemblance to their brothers, Alan and Ron. Short here Part of the genetic history that it runs in our family is that uh, my father and his three sisters all died of colon cancer, and colon cancer is very high rated in males. And my brother and I have to take care of ourselves and be checked up for that. And we feel very strongly that our brothers should know that as well. Jerry and Terry Robinson would now be 48 years old. They were adopted in upstate New York in 1950. Terry may have had operations on his ears and feet. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, a viewer contacted our phone center to tell us that Benjamin Austin Baker once lived as a foster child in his home. With this information, Lois Baker Lane was able to locate her long-lost brother in Everton, Washington. We will bring you the emotional reunion of Benny Baker with his long-lost mother and sister on a future program. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.